Okay, should I start? Hello? Yes. A very yeah. good afternoon. Madam. Good afternoon. Really sorry, I was in the middle of a class and I somehow imagined that this was at 2.30. Uh, so I'm, I'm really sorry about this. It's okay, ma'am. It happens at times for happened. all of us. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand your point yeah, sorry. Well. No, it's okay, ma'am. It's okay, ma'am. Yes, the podium is yours. And let me introduce you at the same time because, uh, uh, you know, yes, we are going to talk, I mean, uh, about, we are going to talk about a very important matter nowadays that is about gender parity and I welcome you ma'am to speak about this particular topic that have been selected and uh, just for our students a uh, very good afternoon to all of you I can get the chance also to say that now uh, let me introduce ma'am uh, Dr. Paramita Chakraborty and she is the former director of Women's Studies Center Jadavpur University and Dr. Chakrabarti is Professor of Department of English, Jadapur University, and she specializes in Renaissance drama, history of madness, gender and queer studies, Shakespearean studies, and performance and film studies. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, my apologies again uh, for, for being late. Uh, really hasn't happened to me before, you have to believe me when I say this. Uh, I don't know, it must be in, you know, just um, imagining that this would start at 2.30 rather than 1.30. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm extremely glad to uh, welcome. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very happy to welcome uh, students of technology to the Heritage Institute. Uh, and I've been associated in uh, Heritage Institute for a while now. So I've been part of the uh, ICC, which is the, uh, the internal complaints committee of the uh, Institute. So um, I'm, I take very great pleasure in welcoming all of you uh, here. And today we are going to talk about gender parity and issues of equality and equity. So um, because I think it's a very important moment uh, in students' lives when they move from uh, school to university to college uh, because I think you you suddenly step into a, a very different kind of a world in in our schools we are usually in a very familiar uh, uh, environment because and and usually in school we are there for a long time you know 10 years 11 years um, if, if you're going to the same school that is uh, and you know we know people and it's usually sort of people like us so, you know, we are in our neighborhoods, we are in our families, we are in our schools, we don't meet very diverse group of people. Uh, the diversity we encounter when we actually step into university or college. Um, and we actually sort of see, you know, how people from different regions, locations, backgrounds, family settings, uh, caste, community, class, um, all come um, to this place and we have to almost uh, uh, be very very cautious um, in you know appreciating diversity and also um, dealing with it so we have to be sensitive we have to be tolerant um, and we have to realize that diversity is actually a blessing you know uh, nowadays increasingly we talk about biodiversity and that if we didn't have biodiversity if the world the entire world was you know became homogeneous then course, you know, the evolutionary process itself will be impeded. So we talk about the necessity of diversity in nature. Similarly, I think it is equally important to appreciate the diversity in human life. Uh, you know, that we come from very different locations, we bring very different things into the mix. So when we are coming from our very, very different uh, locations into this uh, common arena, uh, we are actually bringing very different things and we there is much to learn from each other. So one of the uh, things that I will be speaking about today uh, uh, is this question of diversity and how to handle diversity. Uh, because as I said, you know, uh, the school doesn't really teach us how to handle it very well. So it is at this stage that we almost have to figure out, learn for ourselves, you know, how to how to understand, appreciate, 
this diversity because diversity is also a privilege because it allows us to learn if you're if you're only amongst people like yourselves you will learn nothing um, because you already know that environment you already know that life so unless uh, you meet people from different walks of life uh, there is also uh, no possibility of learning new things experiencing new things uh, etc so i think um, and and this um, great sort of uh, sorry so this great uh, uh, problem i think that people have with diversity manifests itself in things like uh, harassment things like bullying things like ragging and i think it's it's people's own insecurities which manifests itself it's it's you know it's your inability to understand and appreciate difference and and you know difference in other people and and to uh, see it as a learning opportunity instead of that you want to want everybody to be like yourselves and if they are not like you then you sort of punish them in different ways by bullying them by ragging them etc so i think it shows a certain kind of insecurity in ourselves to be intolerant of others and this intolerance to show this intolerance through violence so i think one of the things that we need to understand is how we are going to understand this diversity how we are going to also understand why it sometimes causes insecurity in ourselves it causes insecurity because we often don't know how to deal with diversity we just want everything around us to be like us if it's different we just sort of we are afraid of being caught on the wrong foot we are afraid that we wouldn't know how to behave and therefore we just sort of start punishing the different people who are different from us so i think um this is a huge moment in your lives when you will be confronted with difference of all kinds and you will be expected to step up and uh show yourselves as people who not only understand diversity but also see it as a privilege as something that uh, you know keeps life interesting imagine how boring life would be if everybody was just the same so i think uh, um, this is uh, you know uh, a, a real sort of learning opportunity for you you're stepping into and and i'm hoping really sort of that very soon you should be able we should be able to welcome you on campus um and you know see you sort of in face to face classes face to face situations uh, because that will also give you an opportunity of appreciating this difference um what i want to speak specifically about is this question of gender parity uh, and how that affects you know this question also of uh, sexual harassment because i represent the uh, internal complaints committee which is a committee specifically constituted to tackle uh, issues of sexual harassment so i will be talking about you know the relationship between genders and what can actually prevent uh, sexual harassment now it's important for you to be aware and i'm sure most of you are uh, aware of the fact that um, in 2013 following the terrible case of the nirbhaya rape which i'm sure all of you um, i'm sure you were all all in school and quite young but i'm sure you know uh, what you know what it was uh, so following that uh, there were two major legal reforms that happened in our country uh, one is that the sexual assaults law um, was reformulated you know the rape law was reformulated and it became a much more general it became a part of a much more general sexual assaults law um and we also got another law which has to do with the prevention prohibition and redressal so listen very carefully prevention prohibition and redressal of uh, uh, sexual harassment of women uh, at the workplace so this particular 2013 law basically mandated that all workplaces all professional places should have uh, an internal complaints committee which would deal with cases of sexual harassment now sexual harassment is considered to be you know one of these uh, issues which are pervasive but not talked about it's one i mean there's a huge silence around it there is huge under reporting of cases of uh, harassment um and this i'm saying even 
you know, standing at the end of 2020, we've already seen a huge wave of, you know, what was called the Me Too movement. Um, many of you are, I'm, hope, I'm hoping, uh, quite aware of the Me Too movement when women in different sectors of life, different walks of life, whether it is in media, whether it was in films, whether in academia, women came out um, and spoke about uh, the terrible harassment they had experienced at different points of their lives, but they hadn't been able to speak about it before. Um, and somehow, you know, this particular moment, they felt empowered to come and speak about it. Many of them were speaking about incidents that had happened like 10, 12, 13 years ago, but they were not in a position in their workplaces at that time. They were not secure. There was no law. There was no protection of the survivor of sexual harassment. So they were not able to negotiate uh, with it. So many of them left their jobs or that particular job you know, where they were being harassed. Uh, many of them just uh, kept quiet about it. Many of them had severe trauma around it. Many of them had to have you know, long periods of uh, uh, psychotherapy. Uh, because of that experience, because they had also bottled up this experience as themselves. So uh, I think the 2017 Me Too movement also has alerted us to the fact at how pervasive, how widespread sexual harassment really is. And because it is so widespread, we really need to recognize it as one of the commonest uh, uh, experiences of women at the workplace. And one of the experiences which makes it difficult for women to become workers. So I think, you know, um, and one of the sort of movements that happened around this time was also, uh, you know, Me Too in academia. And this was called uh, the list, you know, the notorious list. So uh, a, a student called Raya Sarkar, um, she compiled a list of women who had been harassed um, in classrooms, in um, higher education institutions by extremely well-known illustrious professors, male professors. And she basically sort of called out to these women and said, you know, now is your chance to talk about these incidents of harassment, which in many cases had, you know, actually uh, uh, impeded women from having academic careers. I mean, when you when you have that kind of an experience early in your life, you just think, you know, let me just get out of here. I don't want this to continue. I'm not interested in academics. If academic men are like this, I don't want to be in this world. So many women had actually left uh, academia following these incidents. So, um, and they came out and spoke. And uh, they compiled this list of people uh, who were in prominent positions of the academic world, who had engaged in uh, perpetrating situations of harassment. So that also alerted us to the fact that this, I mean, the academic world is, is rife with uh, incidents like this. So it's not just, you know, the glamour world, it's not just film industry, it's not just journalism. It is also the academic world, which is supposed to be comparatively safer for women. But in fact, it isn't. So I think, you know, um, we need to be aware, first of all, of how common harassment is. And many women, I think, also normalize it because it is very common. I think, you know, uh, most women in this group, I don't know how many women there are, would agree that, you know, when you go into a public space, you almost expect to be harassed because this has been our experience since our childhood, you know. You get on a public bus, you get on, uh, you know, you are walking along a road which at night, which is, you know, slightly quiet, slightly dark. Um, you will be whistled at at least, you know, uh, if not actually groped or, or uh, you know, molested. Uh, so public spaces are not safe is what women are told, you know, right from the beginning of their lives. And they, they just sort of grow up thinking, OK, this is knowledge I have to grow up with, I have to deal with. They don't see it as something that needs to be reported, something that they should protest against. Sometimes they do protest in terms of, you know, actually sort of uh, making it known within that sort of area. But they don't actually go to the police to report public harassment. And especially at workplace, they're afraid that they lose their jobs, that they will be blamed. And this is this kind of victim blaming is also very common. So they feel that they will be blamed. Uh, they don't report. And they don't 
often see it as a special kind of crime which uh, needs to be reported. So they normalize it, naturalize it, try to accept it, try to negotiate with it. Uh, and I think that is also a problem. So I think both men and women need to be aware of this law. Uh, they need to appreciate that this is a common practice, but this is a crime. We also have to recognize it as a crime. Both men and women have to recognize it as a crime. So that when it happens, we need to report it just as we would report any crime. If there's a theft in my house, if uh, there's, uh, you know, um, something happens to me, uh, if somebody comes uh, in and breaks into my house, I report it. Similarly, if somebody invades my personal space, calls me names, uh, you know, sexist, uh, behaves in a very sexist manner with me, I have a right, the law gives me the right as a woman uh, to protest against it. So I think women need to be aware of this. They don't, they shouldn't normalize it because the more you normalize it, the more uh, sort of uh, social acceptance it gets. And if you have social acceptance of a crime, then you can never actually eradicate it. People just think, okay, chhed chhad hota rehta hai, chalta hai. It's that kind of an attitude. You know, it happens between men. Many people sort of confuse it as part of, as a necessary part of courtship even. Uh, Hindi cinema teaches us to, to think of sexual harassment in this fashion. You would have in the first scene, you know, the boy sort of, you know, stalking the girl, singing songs, whatever, bothering her, and she would turn around and slap him. And then in the last scene, you see that they are getting married. So people just think that, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an essential part of courtship even. But harassment has nothing to do with falling in love or courting a woman, wooing her, anything. Harassment has everything to do with power, inequality of power, of people trying to show you that they are more powerful than you, trying to teach you a lesson. It's got nothing to do with love uh, or any kind of you know, uh, emotional relationship. It's, it's something quite different. So we also need to recognize this difference. We don't need to confuse it with normal everyday life or uh, relationships or courtships or anything. It's, it's something quite different. It is a crime. Courtship is not a crime. You know, Falling in love is not a crime, hopefully. So these are different things. And I, and I think it's still very confused, you know, the, the positions of these things in people's minds. Uh, people often confuse these, these things, which is what leads to a kind of normalization of what is in fact crime. So I think you know the the organization or the or the institution that I represent, which is the uh, Internal Complaints Committee. Uh, I am a I'm an external member of it, but again, you know, as being a member of it, I you know we we all believe that um, the it's not um, we 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 don't really sort of uh, enjoy you know having to arbitrate cases because. It's our students, you know. You don't want to be in a position where you have to punish one student because, you know, they haven't behaved in an appropriate fashion. So what you really want to do, what ICC really wants to do, is to promote prevention. So even what the law says, you know, the first words are uh, prevention, prohibition, and redressal is the final word. So, uh, you know, if there is a case, we will have to handle it. We will have to arbitrate on it somebody has to be punished, you know, there will be a conviction, there will be an inquiry, there will be a conviction, etc. But this is not what you want to do with your students, you know, this is not the relationship ideally people want to have. So basically, if we really don't want situations like this, we should, we really need to focus on uh, preventing such cases. And I think the best way of preventing such cases is to uh, you know, keep on talking about uh, how we are going to uh, look at this question of gender equality, because it is not acceptable that, you know, one gender will have to live in constant fear that they are going to be attacked or raped or molested or, or you know, in some way, uh, uh, you know, bothered. Uh, so it is not fair that they should have to come into a workplace and be in constant anxiety that, you know, if I'm late, if I'm having to go home late, then this will happen. Then I'll, you know, I'll have to ask somebody for a lift or something. I couldn't, I can't go on a public transport. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't wear the clothes I want to wear. 
I can't behave in the way that I want to behave. It might be misconstrued. All of this, why should one sex have to constantly bother about this? It's not fair. Also, we have seen, you know, in education, and I'm because I'm, I represent a, a higher education institution, that's where I'm talking from. This happens in every other sector, as I said. Um, in education, right from the school level, you see that there is a gender gap, what we call a gender gap, and a gender gap of about 20%. And this is quite interesting because uh, when you look at absolute primary stage, if you look at even like a village school in a remote area would have more or less, if not 50% girls, at least 40% girls. So there is gender parity. There is a balance, there is some equivalence between boys and girls. But as the, you know, as you go up, so secondary, high secondary, girls start dropping out. Girls start dropping out, why? Because one reason is of course they are required to work at home. And there we are again talking about gender injustice because girls are uh, always used because people think they don't really need education. They're going to be married. So let them teach, uh, let them learn housework, let them learn things that they will use in marriage. So that's why after secondary, you know, usually parents say, fine, bahut ho gaya, like you can now sit at home and, you know, learn cooking from your mother. And that's when it's around class eight, class nine, that's when the gender gap really starts broadening. And that's when you have, uh, you know, this difference between uh, uh, in classes, in any ordinary class you step in, and you will see that, uh, you know, the, the gap between the percentage of girls and boys is roughly 20%. You know, more than 70 years after independence, this is the situation that we are in. 50% of the population are still not being educated. So, and by the time you go to higher education, the gap is gap widens. Um, and at university, especially if you look at subjects like yours, which is, you know, which are called the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. If you look at these subjects, um, what, what is the percentage of girls still? It's extraordinarily small. If you look at teachers also, if you look at, because if women are not taking to technology, how will you find women academics in technological subjects? And I come from a university, which is Jadavpur University, which is, you know, which has a, a very famous engineering department. It's also considered a very progressive, politically progressive college, which believes in equality of all kinds. But even in Jadavpur, when you go into an engineering faculty meeting, you will see probably five women sitting there while there are 18 men taking the decisions because it's, it's a question of simple majority. So when you have a clearly gender unequal situation in academia, particularly in certain disciplines, then you're bound to have a situation where harassments would happen. So because women feel cornered, simple example I'll give you, for the longest time in one, I think it was the mechanical engineering department, I might be wrong, it could be something else, or maybe the civil engineering department, where there are really, really very few women. And for the longest time, it didn't have, I think, any women teachers, professors. So they didn't have a, a, a women's bathroom. So women had to come, you know, and, and go to the bathroom in some other department. Because you, you don't even imagine that, you know, there's going to be some kind of gender parity, gender equality in your department. So you don't even make provisions for women. You don't even have infrastructure for women. So then how are women supposed to feel protected uh, and safe and provided for if you know, if you don't even have something as basic as a women's bathroom, women's toilet. So I think you know there is this sort of uh, issue here which I wanted to focus on, uh, which is this issue of you know we are not even open to diversity. We just don't even imagine that a simple thing like gender diversity. We are not even prepared for that infrastructurally because we don't imagine that you know there will be women. So what I think what I think is critical for us to understand is is to welcome diversity, 
make provisions for diverse people. And now, of course, we don't even talk about the two genders. You know, it's multiple genders we talk about. We talk about transgender people, transsexual people. So we are not just talking about, you know, men and women here. They also need separate toilets. Are we even prepared? We are talking about disabled people. Do we have, you know, do we have enough ramps for them? Do we have uh, special uh, disability-friendly toilets for them? Do we have teaching provisions for them? So, or are we just imagining that everybody is going to be like us and, uh, you know, if we have enough provisions, nobody needs to bother about anything else. So what I'm trying to point out is that, you know, uh, because I'm speaking from a perspective of preventing uh, harassment, because I'm here in that capacity to talk in that capacity, the best way of preventing harassment is to promote gender justice in whichever department you're in. The best way of enabling women, because you need to enable women so that they cannot be easily harassed. They will stand up for their rights. They will, they will themselves prevent the harassment from happening. So you need to strengthen them. You need to enable them. One of the ways of enabling both men and women and all genders is by talking more and more about these issues of diversity, sensitizing people, making people understand these issues better. But the other way of doing it is also by making provisions for diversity so that you know, your, your department is open to diversity and is catering to diversity. So all of these things one would expect as a new student body entering a new college, uh, you would do. And I have very high hopes of, of this generation uh, of young people because I, I work with young people. You know, uh, we, we hope that you're going to do better than we did. Um, and so very best of wishes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make everybody aware of the existence of the um, ICC um, and information about the ICC, who are its members, who is the external, what are their phone numbers, how to get in touch if there's such an incident that happens. Uh, all of that should be on your website, but you can ask your teachers for it. Um, and uh, all I can say is just, you know, just uh, sort of welcome you very, very warmly, very fondly. Uh, and hope that we can meet uh, face to face some point in the in the next year and also hope um, that you will have very open minds to a diversity and and uh, particularly gender diversity and be very sensitive uh, and appreciative of difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for making our this new batch of students, new friends that new young minds be aware of how to understand and accept this gender diversity situation. And um, thank you uh, once again from us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And, and again, apologies to everybody. It's okay, ma'am. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. We understand, ma'am. It's okay. okay. Thank you.